11 is man's first attempt to demonstrate the ability to go to the moon, to land there, and to return to Earth. The moon landings weren't child's play. An ambitious timetable to reach the moon was set by a desperate president, a competitor in the Cold War whose superiority in space technology spurred Americans to action. Then, the unwavering resourcefulness of American business and science to surmount overwhelming odds. Pressure, brilliance, determination, and some luck all came together to result in the successful moon landing 54 years ago. But now researchers from Michigan State and Ohio State believe they have evidence that Armstrong's utterance may have been shaped less by space than by something. Indeed, American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin made history on July 20th, 1969, when they became the first people to set foot on the moon. When Armstrong walked for the first time, he remarked, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. However, the Soviet astronaut disclosed prior to his passing that there were a few reasons why it would not have occurred or not for a very long time. Why is the Apollo 11 moon landing regarded as such a watershed moment in human history? And what was their secret? Was the goal solely to become the first to reach space? Or did something else factor in? Join us as we explore the secrets of the moon landings and the dangers and challenges of the mission to the moon. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. It was President Kennedy's call to arms to a special joint session of Congress on May 25, 1961, that kicked off the American effort to send astronauts to the moon. I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal, before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. As the United States lagged behind the Soviet Union in space exploration, Kennedy's audacious idea was met with enthusiasm in the era of the Cold War. To ensure the safety of the projected launch vehicle and spacecraft combination, NASA launched the first unmanned Apollo mission in 1966, after five years of work by an international team of scientists and engineers. A fire broke out on the launch pad of the Apollo spacecraft and Saturn rocket during a manned test launch on January 27, 1967, at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. The fire claimed the lives of three astronauts. As soon as Armstrong and Aldrin planted the American flag on the moon's surface, President Richard Nixon communicated with them through telephone radio transmission. I made my mistakes. But in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned it. When Nixon made this call, he said it was the most historic phone call ever made from the White House. You by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. NASA and its thousands of employees persevered despite the setback and the first manned Apollo mission, Apollo 7, orbited the Earth in October 1968, successfully testing many of the complex technologies required to carry out a journey to and landing on the moon. Apollo 8 returned with three men from the far side of the moon in December 1968, and Apollo 9 conducted the first orbital tests of the lunar module from Earth in March 1969. In preparation for their landing in July, the three astronauts of Apollo 10 performed a dry loop around the moon in May. On July 16th, with the eyes of the world on them, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins lifted off from Kennedy Space Center. On July 19th, after a 76-hour journey covering 240,000 miles, Apollo 11 entered lunar orbit. The following day, Armstrong and Aldrin departed aboard the lunar module Eagle, while Collins remained in the command module. The Eagle touched down on the southwestern side of the Sea of Tranquility two hours after it first began its fall to the lunar surface. In a now famous radio transmission, Armstrong informed Mission Control in Houston, Texas, that the Eagle has landed. On Earth, people could feel the weight lift. Roger, Twan, Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Spacecraft communicator, 
Capcom, Charles Duke stuttered to Armstrong, who, with Buzz Aldrin, had just become the first astronauts to safely land on the moon. While Command Module pilot Michael Collins peered down alone from high above the lunar terrain, this historic encounter on July 20, 1969, marked the end of a harrowing journey to the lunar surface. However, the pair of NASA astronauts still faced a plethora of risks during their surface operations. The safe landing was not guaranteed for the skilled pilot. Armstrong and Aldrin had no knowledge that an overlooked impact of Newtonian physics had already altered their moon landing plans after they had arrived in lunar orbit and later separated from the command module to begin their landing procedure. Some hours prior, when the spidery lunar module Eagle undocked from the command module Columbia, the tube connecting the two spacecraft wasn't adequately ventilated, giving Eagle an extra boost as it separated. When Armstrong first noticed they were going to overshoot their landing spot, it was only nine minutes before touchdown. He estimated they would miss by around three miles, which was a near-educated guess. In reality, they missed by four. The landing site was selected because it is relatively smooth compared to the rest of the moon, which is covered in pebbles and craters. Because of this change in the flight schedule, the two travelers needed to locate a new landing spot. Throughout their descent, the Eagle's computer had been keeping them distracted with program alarms, as if all that wasn't enough drama. The quality of the radio connection to mission control was also poor. The landing computer on board kept sounding the alarm, warning of a potential overload. The alert was only going off sometimes, so mission control gave the go-ahead to land because they didn't think the computer would crash. Another issue became apparent as the clock ticked away and the two watched the lunar surface approach by the second they were using more fuel than expected. Since they had virtually depleted their fuel supply from overshooting their landing, finding a suitable landing site was of the utmost importance. Flight controller Steve Bales noted in an interview, you never want to travel under the dead man's curve. To paraphrase the pilot, it was an altitude where you really don't have enough time to execute an abort before you had crashed. Armstrong gently touched down the Eagle on the makeshift landing spot that would soon become Tranquility Base, the first, temporary, human base on the moon, with only 30 seconds of fuel left in the tank. Armstrong popped the lunar module's hatch five hours ahead of schedule. An attached television camera captured his descent down the module's ladder and transmitted the footage back to Earth, where hundreds of millions of people waited in anticipation. Armstrong's iconic comment, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, was allegedly somewhat distorted by his microphone and supposed to be, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. He walked off the ladder and onto the moon's powdery surface. 19 minutes later, Buzz Aldrin joined him on the lunar surface, and the two of them snapped photographs, planted a U.S. flag, conducted some basic scientific experiments, and chatted with President Richard Nixon via Houston. Another issue was developing when the astronauts went about their post-landing routines after the initial rush of adrenaline wore off. Landing engine fuel line pressure was being monitored by sensors despite the engine being turned off. This can only mean that ice has built up in the line, blocking it, and that the hot engine is heating the backed-up gasoline vapor. This pressure rise was identified as a potential safety risk during discussions between NASA and Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation, the corporation responsible for the development of the lunar module. Plans to open the system's vents were therefore developed. There was a difficulty, but before instructions could be sent to Armstrong and Aldrin, the ice plug melted and the gas was released. Before Apollo 11, scientists couldn't be certain that Armstrong and Aldrin would land on stable ground, despite the fact that the area beneath Tranquility Base appeared to be free of any stones that would have harmed the lunar module as it touched down. Suppose it behaved like quicksand, though. Fluffy accumulations of moon dust might potentially conceal jagged shards of rock, which might injure moonwalkers or the lander. NASA wasn't sure the lunar surface was safe for extravehicular activity, EVA, until Neil Armstrong crunched his one small step into the gray powder. This was despite the fact that robotic missions like the Surveyor Landers had been sent to study the surface in preparation for later Apollo missions. 
Even though this is a relatively insignificant event, moon dust is a serious business. There are no processes on the moon that could dissolve the tiny particles created over billions of years by meteorite impacts to make them smoother. The abrasive dust was more than just an annoyance for the Apollo astronauts. Reports have surfaced of these tiny shards of rock entering lunar module interiors, coating helmet visors, jamming zippers, and even penetrating layers of protective spacesuit material, especially on later flights following Apollo 11, which involved longer EVAs. Every single astronaut griped about the dust. Dust is kicked up by the very act of getting to the moon. When an astronaut walks or a rover moves, dust is kicked up. Due to the lack of an atmosphere, the dust will spread like wildfire and adhere to everything in its path. When humans first ventured into space in 1969, scientists were still learning about the effects of space radiation and dust on astronaut health. Only a small number of robotic landers had successfully touched down on the moon's surface by 1969. Although these landers verified that the moon's surface was rocky, dusty, covered with craters, and devoid of complex life forms, measures for probable infection by extraterrestrial bacteria still had to be followed but only after the Apollo astronauts had contracted these imaginary space bugs. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins risked their lives for the betterment of humanity. And when they returned, they were subjected to the indignity of being quarantined for the protection of the Earth in case a fatal space-borne illness had hitched a trip with them. When the Apollo 13 crew returned to Earth on July 24, 1969, Looks good here, flight good agree. They were taken to a mobile quarantine facility en route to NASA's Lunar Receiving Laboratory at Johnson Space Center, where they were housed in a more permanent facility until their release on August 10, 1969. However, what was likely to be the scariest part of the Apollo 11 landing never occurred. Thirty years after the fact, the White House revealed a speech that had been written for former President Richard Nixon in the case of mission failure. The president was ready to address the public when it became clear that the pioneering mission had been lost, despite the fact that many different things may have gone wrong. The text ends on a poignant note. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. The in the event of moon disaster speech was never delivered, but it was kept on file as a sobering reminder that space travel is a risky business that has killed many pioneers since the dawn of the space era. Meanwhile, the Apollo 11 crew made history by landing on and thriving in an alien world for the first time. Five additional lunar landing missions would be successful, while one would be an unscheduled detour. Due to malfunctioning equipment, Apollo 13 had to abort its moon landing. On December 14, 1972, Apollo 17 astronauts Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt departed the moon. They were the final humans to set foot on the lunar surface. An estimated 400,000 engineers, technicians, and scientists put countless hours into the Apollo program, which ultimately cost $24 billion, almost $100 billion in today's currencies. Kennedy's 1961 order to beat the Soviets to the moon was the justification for the cost. But once that goal was achieved, the continued sustainability of the missions was called into question. Half a century later, NASA plans to send humans back to the moon. However, human moon landing remains a highly risky endeavor. SpaceX will build NASA's next moon lander. And just recently, the government has asked other businesses to construct other landing modules of a different design. Whatever spacecraft makes it to the moon first will face daunting but ultimately surmountable obstacles. The Earth's atmosphere serves as a buffer for spacecraft coming in for a landing. However, the moon has a very thin atmosphere, on par with Earth's upper atmosphere where the ISS is located. Due to the vacuum, more fuel is needed for braking. Because of the scarcity of fuel, there is little room for astronaut error. Naturally, there is a backup plan in place in case of urgent activities like flight course correction. However, catastrophic setbacks are not an option if the aim is to succeed. Also, the moon does not have a global positioning system. 
Aircraft on Earth rely on the United States Global Positioning System, GPS. When an airplane or other flying machine is in the air, it gives precise landing coordinates. However, such a satellite network does not exist in the Moon's orbit. Because of this, astronauts would have to navigate in the same way they did more than 50 years ago on the Apollo missions. The computers on board the lunar lander will determine the precise landing spot on the Moon. In the event of a system failure, astronauts might take manual control of the spacecraft, just as Neil Armstrong did. Thankfully, astronauts will have a lot more help from contemporary technology as they prepare for landing. In order to create a map of the ground below, modern terrain relative navigation technology employs a camera. Because of this, the lander may be guided away from any dangerous rocks or craters in its path. It's important to remember that crashing into a boulder can be disastrous for the spaceship and its occupants. It was the Apollo crew's pleasure to explore the moon's illuminated limb. However, during the Artemis mission, astronauts will really enter a crater on the moon's south pole. Scientists on other planets believe that this extremely frigid and gloomy area is rich in ice and other vital minerals. There, the sun will never shine above your head. The light source is always below the horizon, allowing for extremely lengthy shadows to be created on the ground below. Landing with these shadows cast on the ground will be disorienting. Therefore, it will not be simple to land on the moon's dark side without the aid of satellite navigation systems or Earth's atmosphere. However, beginning in 2027, the Aerospace Administration plans to conduct a series of annual moon landings. These efforts, like the successful Apollo flights of half a century ago, will amaze the globe. Still, lunar dust is a significant obstacle to human exploration of the moon. For the first time since the end of the Apollo era, humans will set foot on the moon again in the coming years. The next step is for NASA and other space agencies to build the facilities required to keep humans living there. This will involve both orbital facilities like the Artemis Gateway, formerly the Lunar Gateway, and ground stations like the Artemis Base Camp at NASA and the International Moon Village at the European Space Agency. The European Space Agency, ESA, has assembled a team of scientists to work on solutions to the issue of lunar dust. Regolith on the moon's surface has not been smoothed over time by geological processes, wind and water erosion, because the moon is an airless body that does not experience precipitation. Therefore, over billions of years, the surface was pulverized into fine particles with razor-sharp edges due to bombardment from micrometeorites. And since there's no atmosphere to block the sun's rays, the dust gets a powerful static charge. One of the most frustrating and limiting aspects of exploring the lunar surface is the dust and how it sticks to everything, from skin to suit material to metal, and how it acts like friction to slow you down. The Chinese U-21 rover became stuck on the lunar surface on its second day of exploration, proving that the regolith is also dangerous to robots. The problem was eventually fixed, and the rover continued to operate for a few more months, although the Chinese government said it had suffered a control circuit malfunction in its driving unit, likely caused by dust seeping inside. The chemical and abrasive properties of lunar dust can vary greatly depending on its source region. Therefore, it is crucial to know the exact qualities of lunar dust in a certain area before choosing a landing site. The European Space Agency has collaborated with the French innovation and technology developer COMEX the German Institutes for Textile and Fiber Research, and the Austrian Space Forum, a citizen science organization inspired by the Apollo missions, to create new materials that can survive on the moon. NASA's Artemis III mission, which will take place in the coming years, will bring humans back to the moon. By 2028, they want to have completed the program for sustainable lunar exploration by erecting the Artemis Gateway in orbit and the Artemis base camp on the surface. The European Space Agency is an integral element of these initiatives and has ambitions to construct a lunar base to replace the ISS. In order to live, work, and explore the moon for lengthy periods of time, astronauts will need the appropriate safety systems in place. The astronauts' spacesuits are a crucial part of this system because they will be their only defense against the lunar environment and its inherent dangers. 
What do you think of our return to the moon? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.